Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone on the planet. Enthusiasts, Delphi developers, glad to have you here in this new webinar, a webinar about our VCL grid work horse, uh, the grid that empowers you to create an, uh, or add a lot of functionality in your Delphi applications. And we are going to uh, give you an overview of its uh, capabilities here in this webinar. And it's a webinar for starters, so also Delphi developers with no prior experience in our VCL grid will be right here at home. And the topics for today uh, are listed here, are based on what we think is important to understand and uh, to be aware of to create high performance applications with Delphi and our VCL grid. And of course, also based on your inputs, we received numerous um, inputs with um, questions for um, talking about it here in this webinar. So um, this is the list of what will be covered today. We will have an overview of the data and the memory architecture of our VCL grid. Very important to understand how you can use it well also with large amounts of data. We will also have a look at the use of virtual cells and setting the cell properties in a dynamic way. The grid can deal with numerous file formats, so we are also going to have a look at that. And of course, the grid is in many use cases used for editing data. And so we are also going to have a look at the um, in-place editing within uh, the grid, as well as uh, the various uh, validation um, capabilities of the grid to uh, validate the input of users when they are editing. And finally, we are also uh, going to spend time on discussing what's available, what you can do with the built-in sorting and the built-in uh, filtering capabilities. So, first of all, let's have a look at the uh, data and memory architecture of the grid. It's important to uh, note that um, internally the grid stores the cell information and the cell information in this case is the string, the text value for a cell, as well as a reference to an object. So you can store additional information along with the text for a cell. Uh, that this is based on a sparse list of such string object pairs. That means that uh, when you are not specifying text or not specifying an object for a cell, that there will not be uh, any memory allocated for that cell only cells where you set text or where you, where you set uh, objects, uh, only for these cells memory will be um, allocated. And so, as I mentioned, the data of the cell itself, this is a string, and so a Delphi string is uh, used for that. Of course, you can do uh, much more with um, cells than just store strings text. Um, you can set all kinds of properties. You can add um, graphical objects to cells. And um, when this is being used, only when this is being used um, internally in the grid, a T-cell properties object is created. This T-cell properties object is created by the grid and as such fully managed by the grid at the application level. You do not need to bother about this internal created object. It will also be, of course, automatically destroyed when the grid is being destroyed. So what exactly is this T-cell properties object doing? What is it used for? Well, first of all, um, actually, you as an application developer, you do not directly need to use the T-cell properties object. Um, it is something internally used in the grid, but we mention it anyway here in this webinar because we believe it's important to understand the underlying architecture to um, make the proper decisions of how you are going to use the grid for your specific scenario. 
So the T cell properties object is internally created. It contains uh, several uh, properties, um, but you don't have to access it directly. No, the grid provides uh, wrapper properties, wrapper functions that will internally deal with this T cell properties object. And within this object, T cell properties, there are three important sub objects. There is first of all the graphic object and there is also the cell object and the control. And the reason for this is that um, we have tried to keep the memory size of the T cell properties object as small as possible, only containing um, the minimum uh, information needed for, uh, for example, uh, setting a cell background color, font color, alignment, these things. And only when additional uh, features in a cell, such as adding a, a graphical object in the cell, that only when this is used, an additional graphic object is created, and as such, uh, using memory. And only when you use it, uh, this memory will be uh, allocated. The cell object itself is a reference to an object that you can add yourself, an application level object that you can associate with a cell in uh, the grid. And also a reference to a control, also optional, if you would want uh, to add controls, custom controls created at um, application level, add these two uh, specific cells in the grid. And so this graphic object, as I mentioned, is used when uh, graphical objects um, are added to a cell. And by graphical objects, I mean a series of uh, different uh, types of graphical objects. And that can include a uh, checkbox, an, a picture, a radio button, a regular button, a glyph image list um, image, a uh, progress bar, and so on. And so let us have a look at this uh, cell properties object. Uh, so here you can see the uh, properties that are uh, available in this T cell properties object. And as you can see, it contains, for example, um, properties for keeping the background color of the cell with the brush color, brush color two, in case you want to use a gradient for a cell. It uh, also introduces something like the cell span X, cell span uh, Y. And uh, this is used for uh, when you use cell merging. Uh, these properties are used to indicate um, over what span of cells vertically and horizontally uh, a cell is merged. You can also see things like um, the node level that is used for cell nodes to expand collapse uh, rows. Um, the graphic object, uh, you can see this is the reference to uh, that object when it is used, when you use these graphical elements in uh, the cell. Other things like V alignment to set the uh, vertical alignment of text within the cell or the wrap, word wrap property uh, that you use to specify whether a cell text is rendered with or without uh, word wrapping. And uh, as I mentioned, this T cell properties object is internally used in the grid. You do not need to deal with it directly at application level with the T ADV string grid interface. No, we have made it easier and we have um, exposed at grid level several properties that will then internally deal with T cell properties to store this information. And among these properties are grid.cores, for example, and which is a simple uh, two-dimensional array property where you can set the background color of a cell or the alignments where you set the uh, vertical, the horizontal alignment, uh, left, right, or center. You control the word wrapping, yes or no, within a cell or uh, all the specifications about the font that is being used in a cell. It will also be used, for example, when we um, start using uh, cell merging, when you call grid merge cells, um, 
then it will create also the cell properties objects and set all the characteristics of the merged cells um, in these objects. It will also use it, for example, when you associate a control with um, a cell via the property grid.controls. Okay, let's move to the next page. And here we have a look at the T cell graphic object. As I mentioned, this is an object that is created within the T cell properties as soon as um, an object like a uh, checkbox radio button, um, image list image, picture, icon, you name it, uh, when these kinds of objects are needed and um, added to a cell. And uh, here you can see uh, the various properties inside, like the cell type, how it is aligned horizontal and vertically within the cell and several other characteristics that depend on the type of graphic object added to a cell. And if we have a look at the different types of um, graphic objects that are at this moment supported, this is uh, the list of these uh, types. So uh, you can see, you can add bitmaps, icons, image list images, radio button, checkboxes, progress bars, um, progress bars, uh, balloon hints, um, all these kind of things can be added to a cell. Of course, um, this is internally in uh, the grid. Um, and we also provide here easy to use wrapper functions uh, that uh, will, under the hood, create such a T cell graphic object as soon as, for example, you call grid at checkbox or at node, at picture, um, etc. Also, here, um, evidently, um, this T cell graphic object is uh, fully managed by the grid and it will also be automatically managed and destroyed by the grid. So there is no uh, need to worry about that. The grid manages that and will, of course, take care that there is no memory leak, that everything is properly destroyed when it needs to be destroyed. And we add um, some um, graphic objects, just like a bitmap. Um, this is, for example, a code snippet that shows how you could add a bitmap to a specific cell in the grid. And as you can see, okay, you create the bitmap, you load it from a resource, and then you call grid.addBitmap. When you add this bitmap to the grid cell, you actually add a reference to that T bitmap object to the cell. And that means that as long as the grid needs to display this bitmap, it needs your bitmap uh, object. And that, of course, implies that as soon as you destroy this uh, bitmap that was added to a cell, the grid can no longer uh, use it and can no longer, as such, render the cell containing the bitmap. The alternative is that you um, use the grid.create bitmap call. And this will internally in the grid create a T bitmap instance for you that you can use to put some bitmap into uh, this bitmap object. And at that point, the grid will manage that T bitmap object itself and will keep it alive as long as it is needed. But um, you don't have to worry about it anymore. Still, add bitmap is here and it can be important to use add bitmap instead of create bitmap for the simple reason that imagine the same situation that you have a grid with 1 million cells. If you would um, call grid.create bitmap 1 million times, you would have created 1 million uh, T bitmap objects, which of course is not a good idea for um, memory management. And that's why add bitmap can help you because here you can create one bitmap uh, just once and add it to multiple cells in the grid. So you will have only one bitmap resource and uh, use it multiple times for multiple cells in the grid. And this is of course 
way more uh, memory friendly. Um, custom objects. So um, imagine that you have uh, data loaded in the grid and you want to associate um, pointers to uh, your own objects where you manage uh, additional data, data that is maybe not necessarily visible in the grid. Uh, for that, you can use um, your own objects that you assign to a specific cell. Um, it's important to know that when you create an object at application level and you assign that to grid.objects, that these objects are just for the grid references to these uh, objects, but these are not managed by the grid, meaning that um, the grid will not destroy the objects that you assign yourself this way. And so you will need to uh, clean up these objects when, for example, uh, you close your application or the form uh, gets uh, destroyed. Okay, but for, before we go to the topic on uh, virtual cells and dynamic cell properties, um, I have prepared a first uh, demo about um, the cell memory management data, etc. And so let's have a look here in the Delphi IDE at this first demo that I prepared. So here is basically the default ADV string grid dropped on the form and uh, several uh, buttons from where we will exercise some code. Um, and, and let's see what happens here. The first button is simply filling the grid with text. So every grid cell, this is the cells property that we use to set the cell text. Also important to note is um, that the VCL DADV string grid descends from the standard Delphi VCL T string grid. That means that all the properties, events, everything actually that you might already have used in the standard VCL T string grid is also available in the ADV string grid. The ADV string grid is basically a huge extension of that standard T string grid that is already included standard in Delphi. Um, so here uh, we simply loop over all the cells, set the cell text. Here we simply loop over um, all the grid, uh, over all the cells and set a grid object. Here, we are not creating an uh, actual object, rather we cast a uh, long int to a T object because we can simply assign a long int to an uh, object uh, reference. And what we do to uh, visualize what we have set in the grid cell, we have implemented the on click cell event. And what we are going to do here is if we have clicked an actual cell, then we get the object reference, cast it to a long int, and will actually display via a message the cell text content and also the value of the object that was set. So we split it again in a low word and a high word to uh, show it in the message box. And as you have seen in um, the code, in the objects, here we simply set the column co coordinate and the row coordinate in uh, the cell. Another thing that we are going to do is um, use the cell properties. So here we are going to set some cell background color to yellow, font color of another cell to red. We are going to change the alignment in a cell, setting it to centered and also change the font style of cell 44 to bold. And maybe it's good to uh, exercise these functions first. And let's have a look and let's see this um, in action. So when I click, there is no cell value and there is a null reference in grid.object. So obviously 
it returns here that the object points to zero, zero. When I now fill cells and also do fill objects, when I click a cell, you can see that the cell text is two, uh, four, and the object is an integer that consists of the column and row number, so that's two, four. And now I set some cell properties, and so you can see that uh, this cell got the yellow background, the red font, etc. Let's go a step further and explore what happens here in this code. Here we are going to add uh, graphical objects to a cell. And so, as I explained in the first slides, that means that underlying the graphic object will be created that holds and manages the characteristics of these graphic objects. And so, what we are going to do is we are going to add a checkbox. We are going to add a button to cell 2.1, a button with a specific width and height, specific text, and a specific alignment uh, with respect to the cell text. We are also going to add a radio button column. So that is a column filled with radio buttons. And uh, in that column, only one radio button will be um, active when you click on another cell and um, the other radio button in the other cells will uh, be unchecked. We are also here going to create an, uh, a radio group within a cell. So here, in this case, we are going to add two radio buttons within cell 4, 1. And default, this sets the orientation of the radio group, and this sets the index of the selected radio button. When we call grid.create uh, radio here, um, we actually um, um, create internally the radio group and for the radio group it offers the strings, a T strings interface to set the text for the different radio buttons within that cell. We are also going to change the row height here and we are going to add image list images to cells cells 5 comma 1 2 and 3 and so the image list is on uh, the form you can see the image list here with some um, images added and that image list is of course uh, connected to the grid here via the property grid images what more are we going to do we are going to add a node a node to row 1 and that row will have um, a span, a, a node, that node will have a span of uh, nine rows. So with that node, we are going to be able to expand, collapse nine rows within that uh, grid. Here we show also how we can merge cells, so unify different cells into one big cell. So here we are going to merge cell 1,4 and use three cells horizontally and three cells vertically to uh, merge it. And we are going to do all this within a block uh, grid begin update, grid end update. And that is beneficial for performance reasons. That means that the grid will not uh, repaint during all these different calls. It will only do a single repaint at the end of the call to end update. And so for performance reasons, when you add a lot of um, things, graphical object changes to the grid, etc., it is always a good idea to use begin update and update for performance reasons. While we are here, let's also have a look at yet another capability feature of um, the grid, which is the capability to render basic HTML formatted text. So that gives you the full freedom to uh, show whatever you want um, in combination with different formats, formatted texts um, and images combined, etc. Uh, to put that all into a uh, cell text, including 
here, as you can see, the ability to set an, uh, a URL, a hyperlink in a cell that is clickable and that will actually open up um, the web page for that link. Um, yeah, this is here. This is enabling the grid for editing or not. But let's see this in action. That will um, immediately become clear. So let me go to repeat here, set the properties. Here we set some uh, the graphical objects. And as you can see, here is our node. So we can expand and collapse the nine rows in this uh, node span. And notice that here we have this checkbox, we have a button, we have a radio button column, and here we have a radio group within a cell. Here we have a couple of um, image list images added to uh, cells. And um, next, maybe I can also add the HTML. And here, so you can see the HTML formatted text, an image specified through an HTML uh, image tag. And here you can see the uh, hyperlink. And when I click it, it will obviously open Google, but the browser opens on my other screen. So here I bring it in view and you see the Google website opened. What I wanted to explain is that um, here by default now, the checkbox, I cannot check this checkbox and I cannot click this button either, nor this uh, radio button, etc. This is um, by design because our grid is not enabled for editing. So default, when you add objects with a um, specific interaction like a checkbox, radio button, regular button, when the grid is not in editing mode or that cell is read only, then uh, you will not be able to uh, click this. I toggled the editing now and you can already see that the color of these uh, objects changed to active state. And now I can of course uh, click it and you see the radio group behavior within a column. You see the radio group behavior within a cell. And let's uh, add uh, one more thing. I will show you the code uh, of this first. And this is the ability to add a control to a cell. Notice that I have here added on the form an T uh, track bar. And this is what we are going to do. Um, we are going to um, this for, for the demo that we increase the number of rows and columns. And we set to cell 10, uh, row column 10, row 10. We set this uh, track bar, track bar for the grid, the TB grid. We set this track bar for this cell 10, 10. And so let's have a look at what happens when I run this code. So I do cell control. We have now 100 columns, 100 cells, and it is by design that we set this track bar in cell 1010 in as such a not visible cell. If we now scroll uh, in the grid, here you can see that this track bar becomes uh, visible. So the track bar is linked to that specific grid cell and it will of course behave um, fully in sync with uh, scrolling cells uh, within that uh, grid. And a final thing that I want to do to demonstrate maybe a feature that is not so well known and not so much used which is the use of cell markers and this is uh, the thing where Maybe I need to let's, okay, increase the row height a little bit. Um, this is underlying, uh, underlining um, parts of text within a cell um, where you want to uh, draw the attention to. Um, and that is what you can do with the add marker. Let's have a look at the code that was used for that. So here we set the cell text 
and we add the marker for it. So for the same cell, and it means from character six for the length of five characters underlying this with um, red curvy lines. And so that was um, the first look at uh, all kinds of cell objects, graphics, how you can manipulate cell properties, etc. So now uh, let's have a look at virtual cells and dynamic cell properties. What I've showed in the first demo, of course, means that when I set text objects properties to cells, this all consumes memory because under the hood, the grid needs to create objects that hold all the characteristics of these cells. Using the event on get display text, we can actually set text into the grid without the grid needing to allocate memory for um, the text. Um, and with the event on get cell color, we can set characteristics for a cell without the grid here needing to create objects like T cell properties to manage these properties. So basically, you get, uh, you get the capability to manage these characteristics yourself at application level. So um, let's have a look at uh, the demo that shows you these uh, capabilities. And let's pick the proper project for that, this one. And here we have our grid and we have the implementation of on get display text. What do we have? Well, it's uh, simple. When our checkbox uh, random is checked, we get numeric data that we show in cells. Otherwise, we have this hard-coded uh, cell text that we return in uh, this event. And we will set to demonstrate um, that the grid has no problems at all managing that uh, much cells. In, um, we initialize the grid with um, 100,000 rows and 100 columns, and that totals uh, 10 million cells. And so let's have a look and run this second demo. So I say, this is actually what you can see here, is already the text that was retrieved through the event on get display text. And when I click expand rows and columns, I have now 100,000 rows, 100 columns, and I can easily uh, verify that when I go to the, and my cell is not big enough to see the text, it's too large, it gets cut off. Maybe I can increase uh, the cell size. I could also increase the cell size by dragging from the column header and if I would want to do that I would set column sizing here to true but I will also um, already increase it by default and I can do this with the default column width of 72 and I set it to 96 to make more data visible Okay, and let's now scroll to the end. It's apparently still not sufficient. Or am I? Uh -huh. I'm already controlling it. So let's increase it even more. I actually, during creating the demos, I increased uh, the font size so everything would be much more readable for you. And of course, with a bigger font size, the cell needs to be bigger to have all the text visible. But here you can see this is the bottom right cell. This is row 100,000 and column 100. What I have done here is uh, I created a uh, small, well, not so small. I created an array of 1 million integer values. And of course, 1 million integer values uh, will still be smaller than uh, 10 million strings. 
And so what I do here is I fill these 10 million um, integers into that array. And this will be the value that is used here. Let's have a look at the on the display text. When I click the checkbox to get the data instead from my integer array. And what I can also show you uh, right away in the code, when we want to display the random values from our integer array, I'm going to use the onGetCell color, an event that gets triggered at the moment that a cell needs to be rendered. Only then onGetCell color gets triggered. And so uh, here we will dynamically set the background color of the cell depending on the value found in the cell. So here we are going to check this value and actually we set a random value in the cell between 0 and 1000. So when that value is larger than 900, we set it to red. If it's larger than 700 to a dark orange, to orange when it's larger than 500, and we set it to yellow when it's larger than 200. And so let's have a look how that results. Okay, we have our 10 million cells. We um, specify that it uses our random values from our um, integer array. And then we say, okay, use the on get cell color um, event. And here you can see that um, the background color of cells is set according to the value found in the cell. The value found in the cell will actually be the value that is in the integer data array that you have um, created at application level. Here we have a grid with 10 million cells, but the grid is not allocating any memory for the content of the cell, nor for the properties of the cell. And so it uh, manages this uh, 10 million cells um, without any problem and with a very light memory uh, usage. What might a little uh, trick that I wanted to demonstrate in the process of uh, this particular demo, here you can see when I select a cell, that, of course, the cell gets the selection background color. And, of course, when I click a yellow cell, uh, one would not know that, for example, this, what I clicked, is now an orange cell. And it might not be so desirable to lose the real background color when you select a cell. And so what the grid offers is actually, when I enable this, the color mixer, here you can see that it's not that real blue anymore, but it is a mix between, um, actually we are um, blending between the grid selection core and the cell background core. And so the user still has some uh, sense of what the cell background core was. And you can actually uh, choose yourself that degree of uh, blending these colors. Uh, this is uh, here. So the grid has this property selection color mixer. You can set it to true or false. And here you can see the factor of the blending. So if you would set it to uh, 100, it would be uh, the full original uh, cell background color. If you would set it to zero, it would be the full selection core. If you set it to 80, it's like um, a mix in between. So this is what I wanted to show you in the context of um, the use of virtual cells and how you can set cell properly, properties dynamically. And I think this is something uh, very important and something to consider when you have to deal with uh, very large amounts of data uh, maybe when you have to deal with data that is already available in memory structures that you have anyway and you deal with anyway at application level, 
So it might not make sense, at least from the perspective of memory allocation, to duplicate that content by filling each of the grid cells with that data, but rather use these two events to dynamically refer to your own data structures and uh, use the grid as such in a, a memory friendly way. All right, and let's move to our next topic, which is the topic of uh, importing and exporting in various file formats. And I have listed here on this slide um, the methods that are available for you um, for saving, loading in uh, different file formats. Um, load from CSV, I think it speaks for itself that this will load a comma separated file into the grid and save to CSV is uh, the same. But okay, what about insert from CSV, append to CSV? Well, if you call grid load from CSV, that will uh, load all cells of the grid with what it finds in the commerce separated file. While when you do insert from CSV, it will um, insert new rows at the end of uh, the grid cells insert new rows and fill these new added rows with the information, the data from the comma separated file. When you do save to CSV, it will obviously replace a possible already existing CSV file on the uh, local file system. When you do append to CSV, it will actually append the data that is in the grid to an already existing file, if that file already exists, um, append it to that uh, file. Fixed files are files uh, that have a fixed uh, column width. Um, the save to file load from file is actually an, a file format um, that is specific to the uh, grid, to ADV string grid. So it, um, yeah, it, it, it's a custom format, uh, but it's still a text file. And the um, binary format is safe can be used with save to bin file load from bin file um, and the difference the main difference between save to file load from file and save to bin file load from bin file is when you do save to file load from file it will not save for example um, pictures that were added to a grid cell or checkbox with the checkbox state all these kind of things when you uh, want to store all the graphical object information and cell properties, etc. Then you can use a save to bin file load from bin file. Obviously, when you use it and you have a lot of cell properties set, this will generate bigger and also binary files. And then the other formats, I think, speak for itself, like XML, HTML, JSON files, Excel files. That's maybe another important topic to uh, mention. The grid can internally use only automation to save to an Excel file and load data from an Excel file. And this includes XLS and XLSX files, as it will use an installed Excel on the Windows machine, and it will use it through only automation. And of course, um, it can all load all the types of files that Excel can uh, load. But of course, this has the disadvantage that it requires that Excel is, ex is installed on um, the system. We will look or see in a moment that there are also alternatives uh, for that. And just like we had save to file and save to bin file, uh, we can do the same with streams so that you can store the, the stream wherever you want. Could be in a database, for example, uh, that's also possible. And next are a couple of other interfaces to uh, different file formats. First of all, I wanted to uh, mention the ADV Grid Excel IO, which is a um, component that comes with uh, the grid. Uh, it's always included. Um, it's a non-visual component that you hook up to the grid. And this non-visual component enables you to um, read and write XLS files. XLS 
is the format that it uh, supports. And this has not any dependency to Excel. It is not using OE automation. So it will run on every Windows machine. But here it is limited to the .xls file format. We also have a non-visual component for generating a PDF out of the grid and also an uh, RTF file, an RTF file that can be opened with Microsoft Word. And now the question is, of course, if you want to generate XLSX files, the newest Excel uh, file format, uh, also there we have a solution, but that solution has the dependency that it uses TMS Flexel. Uh, the XLSX file format is that huge with that many uh, properties and capabilities that um, it needs the full Flexel library um, to, to use it for exporting and importing data in um, the grid. And um, you can find this um, on our website. It's again on the other screen. I bring it in view. So here you find the information about the VCL grid Excel bridge. It's actually a uh, free download, a free bridge uh, and it will use on one side the VCL grid, on the other side it will use the Flexel library, but all the interfacing between the two to um, then generate the files or read the files is done via this non-visual component for you. So let's um, have a look at um, importing and exporting files. And that is demo number three. And it should be, I guess, this one. Let's open it. Okay. So we are going to load some uh, information from a CSV file and save it back in these different formats. There's one uh, thing that is also important that I did not mention yet. Let's have a look at it first. That is that there are several properties that allow you finer control over how information is saved or loaded into that grid. And this is summarized here on this slide with these uh, properties. Save fixed calls, save fixed rows, fixed cells, hidden cells, virtual cells, with or without HTML, with or without RTF formatted text. And you can also specify from what specific column row to what specific end column uh, or row you need to or you want to uh, save uh, data. And actually this means, for example, when you set save hidden cells to um, false, that will um, imply that when you load a CSV file or another file in the grid, that it will not load the information in the fixed cells of the grid. And the same applies to saving data. When you set save hidden cells to false, it will not use these uh, the data in the fixed cells to generate your CSV file, for example. Um, virtual cells, that's the, the same uh, as we saw in uh, the previous demo. When you set it to true, it will get the value, the virtual cell value, instead of um, the actual cell value. So you can choose here with these uh, settings. Save with HTML, for example, is when you set this to false, it will export the plain text even when your cell was set with uh, HTML tags to give it the text some uh, formatting. So let's see how this works here in this particular uh, demo. Let's bring up the load from CSV implementation. Here you can see that I set save fixed cells to false. So I want my fixed cells in the grid. There is one fixed column and one fixed row. I don't want this um, to be overwritten with what is loaded from a CSV file. So I load uh, this CSV file in the grid and I will set numbering to the first column in that uh, grid. So column one gets auto numbering and then in the fixed row at the top, 
I set the column header text. And what I also do after loading the CSV file is an auto size column. So I let the grid adapt the column width automatically to um, the content of the grid. I will also enable uh, row selection. So that means that selection in the grid is per row. So the unit of selection is always one row or a range of rows. I cannot select a single cell in uh, this mode. And I used an additional property, which is the disjunct row selection. That means that you can use control click to select multiple uh, rows uh, that are not connected to each other. It will become clear when I run and execute this uh, demo. Okay, so here we load uh, from the CSV. And what I have actually done here to uh, see these um, cells in with different background colors is the same technique as I applied in the previous demo. I implemented the on get cell color. And so this dynamically sets the background color according to the value in that specific cell in the specific column. And so this column is the number of cylinders in the car. And so the hot cars are those with eight cylinders. So obviously I gave these the red background color. Uh, you can also see that um, the selection is per row. Notice that there is a slightly different background color um, for the first row here, which uh, the purpose of this is to indicate the row that has the keyboard focus. Um, and when I perform control click, you can see uh, that I can do a disjunct row selection within this uh, grid. Now let's save this to HTML. And that was basically done by calling grid.save to HTML. And that is the actual result when looking at this HTML file in the browser. And the code for that is not much more than, let's have a look here. I set the border size to zero so that we do not see the grid with, um, it's the table in the HTML with a border has no border when I set border size to zero. And this is um, the HTML that gets generated. And I use here the second parameter. Can I make this uh, it's bugging? It's not showing uh, what the meaning is of the second parameter. The second parameter tells the grid, please um, automatically launch the file that you uh, created. Okay. We can do the same for uh, saving this to JSON. And what did I do here? I actually launch a uh, JSON validator uh, website. And you can see here the JSON file that was generated here during this webinar. Now I can uh, drop this on our JSON validator website, process it and actually, actually see that all the JSON um, generated for this particular um, JSON file was a valid JSON file. So here is the content. You can see the cylinders, etc. cetera. Um, all these things um, were saved into the JSON file. I will now save it to Excel file and uh, that is done uh, here with the ADV grid Excel IO component. So that's that additional non-visual component. And I call XLS export, specify the name, and then I will open this XLS file. And when I execute it, it is now opening Excel. And here you can see uh, the data including um, also the properties like the colors that were set uh, generated in an Excel file. And we can also use the non-visual component ADV grid PDF IO. And this uh, component is uh, on the form. It's this component. It is hooked up to the grid. 
and that's all that there is needed to uh, generate here um, this um, PDF file with the content of uh, the grid. And finally, um, we can also uh, print uh, the grid. And to uh, printing is a built-in function. And looking at the code, it's not much more here than a printer setup dialog to select my printer and then call the print uh, function. And there are also under grid.print set, print settings um, a lot of properties that um, you can, with which you can um, have fine control over um, the printing. I see that now it locks up. I'm not 100% sure why. And there is my dialog. I guess that here in this environment it had to look for um, the printers. And so I will select in this case the XPS format from Microsoft. And now it is asking where to save this. And we are going to uh, save this here. We are at demo tree. And we call this grid.xps. All right. And when we look at this folder, this should here be. It is not my XPS file. I'm not sure what I did wrong. Did I select the wrong folder? No, not sure. Let's do this again. Okay. Um, that folder is wrong. I'm looking at the completely wrong folder. I should look here and then uh, here on the webinar folder number three. And here is the expected XPS file. And let's see with the Microsoft XPS viewer, this is that same grid exported to XPF through printing here in this case. And yeah, I aborted the printing, of course. And then we get this message. All right, let's move to the next topic, which is the topic of editing within the grid. Um, first of all, um, Let's have a look at uh, all the different types of editors that are available built in into the grid. And so here you can already see a series of uh, different editor types that are standard available built in. And you can set these uh, editors through the property grid.default editor. By default, when you do not change this property, it will be ed normal. This will be the editor type. And this is just like a regular T-edit that is used for editing in your grid cells. The alternative way to set uh, or to specify what in-place editor you want to use for editing in the grid is via an event on get editor type. And this event is called um, whenever editing is about to start for a cell in the grid. And so let's have a closer look now at the process of uh, starting to edit. Uh, first of all, editing is only started when the go editing is set to true in grid.options. That's uh, obvious. And it's also only started when the grid cell is not read only. We can set it read only uh, in different ways. For example, with the property grid.read only and the column row. Um, and when um, um, the grid, uh, I put it in a different way, you can start the editing when a cell is editable through uh, various ways. You can call, you can um, press the F2 key. You can also click on an already selected cell, or you can um, also use the enter key to start editing in a cell. Also programmatically, you can force a specific cell into uh, edit mode 
with the uh, method grid show in place edit, then it will show the in place editor on the focused cell or directly call grid.edit cell with the column and row that you uh, want to edit. You can also programmatically stop the in place editor with grid uh, hide in place edit. There are various events involved during uh, this process of starting to edit. And the first event, the very first event that gets triggered is the on can edit cell. So this allows you to dynamically control whether a cell is editable or not. This has a var parameter can edit. If you set it to false, the cell will not go into edit mode. The next event that will be triggered is the on get editor type. And that gives you the chance, the possibility um, to um, specify what in place editor you will be using for a specific cell. Um, and it's important that um, after you set the editor type, there is an additional event that will be triggered, which is the on get editor prop. And that stands for getting the in place editor properties. And so if you want to customize um, the properties of that cell in place editor, the on get editor prop event is the place to be. It's also there guaranteed that that in place editor control has been created, um, has the parent set, and you can fully control all its properties. And finally, before the actual editing starts, there is the event on get edit text that you can override if you uh, need that. That event gives you the chance to put data into your in place editor that maybe is different from the actual data that is in a cell. You might have a need to do some manipulation on that cell data before starting the um, in place editor. And let's have a look at what happens to end the edit process. First of all, the edit process ends when a, an in place editor is uh, losing focus. And uh, then a series of events are being triggered. The first being the on cell validate event. So that event allows you to verify whether the input that the user entered is acceptable. Um, notice that uh, by default, this own cell validate event will only be triggered when the cell value changed through editing. Unless you override this and you always want on cell validate to be triggered, uh, there is a property for that um, always validate under grid.navigation.always validate. Then, regardless whether the user changed or didn't change the value while editing, it will trigger on self validate. On set edit text is the event that is the reverse of on get edit text. This will uh, get the value from the in place editor, and you will you can determine this way what the actual value will be that will be set into the uh, cell content. And then the process ends with on editing done, which is the event that is triggered just before your in place editor will be hidden, will disappear. And after this in place editor uh, disappeared, the on edit cell done event is triggered. Some um, in, uh, convenience uh, things that you can use in this process is um, know that the public property grid original cell value will always hold the value of uh, the cell before the in place editing started. So that's uh, something that you can use to always compare uh, with the original value and see, okay, is this value changed here or not? Um, so that is always available, can be used in your different event handlers. And the always validate uh, property that I mentioned to ensure that on self validate is always triggered at the end of the in place editing process and not just when some uh, value changed. 
and um, cell validation. Um, there are different ways to uh, do this cell validation. We will see this in the demo, but here I wanted to mention and already highlight that uh, the grid has a built-in capability to show uh, balloons as a helper uh, to um, show you uh, information why, for example, some um, value that was entered by the user is not correct. Important to note here is that this uh, balloon support, so showing a balloon with information why some entered value is not valid, is only available for in-place editors that are based on regular edit controls and also combo box controls. Um, but with edit controls, we already mean um, a regular edit, an edit control with a button attached, a spin editor control, all edit controls, uh, for example, the numeric only edit control, etc. And the combo box control types, which is the ED combo edit, the editable combo box, and the ED combo list, the non editable editable list uh, combo box. So let's have a look at the demo prepared for um, the editing capabilities. And This is the fourth demo. And let's look at this form. So what do we have um, here? You can see that we are going to do a little manipulation and this code is here for the sake of showing you how you can do this kind of manipulation. Here we are going to change um, the glyph that is shown in an in-place editor, which is an edit control and a little button attached to it. How we can access that in-place editor via grid button edit and manipulate the glyph of that button attached to that edit control. So that's um, the purpose of doing this here in uh, the demo. Um, so I have implemented the two events on get editor type. And here you can see that uh, I have a simple case structure where I will use a different in place editor for different columns. In the first column, it will be a numerical, a numerical edit button. So I can only enter numbers in this control and it will uh, make this available through an edit control with a little button attached. Second column has a spin edit to edit the values. The third has a combo list. Uh, here is a date picker. And finally, in the fourth column, I use yet another technique that I will discuss brief in, in a moment. Um, and the second event that is involved is the on get editor prop. So that's the place where you, when needed, uh, do control over uh, properties of that in place editor. And here, what I will do is for my second column, number two, which is third column, um, I will just set from here the values of the combo box. And that could be needed, for example, if you need different column. Uh, combo box values for different columns, different cells, etc. So here you can dynamically control uh, what values will become available in your combo box. For the validation, I have implemented the on cell validate event, uh, which is this one. And so uh, here I have a radio group with which I control different kinds of validation methods. The first is none. So obviously you're not doing any, any validation in this case. When um, the first validation method is checked, and that is auto correction, what we are going to do is um, 
when the value is larger than 100, we limit it to 100. When the value is smaller than zero, we limit it to zero. And we simply change the value to our modified um, value. And since this event has a var parameter, this is the value that will be used to end the in-place editing. The second validation uh, method is, um, and here we are going to, uh, for the same condition, when it's larger than 100, smaller than zero, here we will uh, use the technique of showing a message. And it would be not good if I would call here a show message like this. Why is this not good? This is not good because, remember, the on-cell validate um, event is triggered when um, the in-place editor is about to lose focus, when it has not lost focus yet, but is about to lose focus. If from that event I will call the show message uh, function, obviously, um, my in-place editor will completely lose focus and it will, as such, interfere with the normal process of ending the editing in the grid. That's why when I want to show a message, I need to hand this over to an other event, which is, let's have a look in the code which is the on edit cell done. And this event is triggered when uh, finally that in place editor lost focus and is hidden is no longer used. So what we do in this on cell validate is perform validation and set a property that the entered value was not acceptable. And this event triggered after on cell validate, then there we simply use this um, setting, this, this uh, Boolean that was set. And from there, we can show a message which uh, will not disturb end of editing process. And as the value obviously cannot be accepted, what we do is simply put back that same cell that has that invalid entry put this back into edit mode. And then finally, the last validation method is through the balloons interface. And so here for the same conditions, larger than 100, smaller than zero, we will set here um, properties that are the characteristics of the balloon hint that will be uh, displayed. So we set the title of the balloon, the text of the balloon, and the icon within that um, balloon. Let's see this in action. That will make things uh, immediately clear. Okay, no validation. So again, here, add any value and it will be accepted. Notice here that little icon that we uh, set to this button. I also implemented a button click handler that will force the value to zero when I click that button. Let's now try the auto correction and now I will enter some value, leave the cell and it was larger than 100 so it was limited to 100. If I set minus 250 it will set the value to zero and then um, when we use the prompt the message, the show message call for uh, values that cannot be accepted I enter 250, leave the cell and here it says invalid, the number is too large, and it sends me back to in-place editing, where when I set an acceptable value, that value is um, in the cell. And finally, when I enable the balloon hints and do the same thing, uh, the invalid value, now you can see this balloon appearing, the in-place editor remains active, so I can set minus 100, still wrong, if I set 50, then this value is um, accepted. And so this gave you an overview of some um, in-place editor capabilities. 
And now I want to uh, bring up um, other part of in-place editing that um, I show here in this demo, which is using a, a not built-in editor of the grid as in-place editor for the grid. And I do this through form control edit link, which is a non-visual component that links any edit control as in place editor for the grids. And how is this done? This is done via assigning, and we will use an IP address editor for that, by assigning that to the form control edit link control property here. And uh, we need to implement at least two events, which is the event on get editor value that needs to grab the value of that edit control as this will be the value that will be set into uh, the grid cell and we also need to implement the on set editor value that will um, when the in place editor is shown it will initialize the value of that in place editor with the value of the cell implementations of these events are quite simple it uh, first this event gets the uh, value of my IP address editor and I get this value via this property as a string and the reverse is setting the IP address as a string uh, taken from the value of the grid cell and so let's see how this works actually before I do this Let's have a look at my on get editor type implementation where you can see that for the last column, I'm specifying that it will be a custom in place editor and I'm specifying my edit link for that. In this case, in this case is that non visual form control edit link that I assign to a grid dot edit link and this tells the grid use that edit link component to manage the in-place editor for that cell. So, okay, we did not see the spin editor uh, yet that I specified. And this is our combo box, it all is as expected. We also have the date picker, which is the standard here in this case, standard uh, VCL date picker control. And here, when I click this, we see our um, IP address editor and we can add a value like this and you see that it's stored in the cell when i click this again i can edit it again uh, oops, more than 255 like that and i can edit this way notice that um, the editor the in place editor will be exactly as it was set here on the form uh, as it is shown on the form it will be shown into that grid cell and you might have noticed that uh, of course this um, cell editor this ip address editor still had its own border and that means okay the grid cell has a border the editor has a border so you see a kind of double border and so to avoid that, um, I remove the border now from this uh, control. And when I do in-place editing now, now this result is somewhat uh, cleaner and behaves uh, like this. So this summarizes um, what I prepared for showing you everything about in-place editing. And then move to the last topic, which is the topic about uh, sorting within the grid and also filtering within the grid. With respect to sorting, it's uh, very simple. You can either sort on one column or you can sort with conditions set for multiple columns. One is called simply sorting. The other is called indexed sorting. You can enable that the user will perform the sorting um, via clicking on the column header cells. And you do this by setting grid sort settings not show to true. Then it will, uh, the grid will use 
standard uh, single column based sorting. Programmatically, you do this via the Q sort, which um, stands for the quick sort algorithm that is internally um, implemented in the grid. If you set uh, sort settings dot index show to true, then you allow the user to perform uh, sorting on multiple columns. Um, and you can also programmatically do this, do this with a Q indexed sort method. Um, by default, when you do nothing, uh, the grid will try to determine itself what the data types are in the different columns of uh, the grid. So things like a date, a number, a float, a string, alphabetical sorting of strings, etc. Uh, by default, the grid will do this or try to do this automatically. But you can guide the grid uh, through the onGet format. The onGet format event is called for every column in the grid. And so there you can override what it tries to automatically retrieve and specify what sort uh, or what compare uh, routine that it should internally use. If you are not, if you have special uh, things, uh, special kinds of data in your grid and you need to therefore provide special comparison code, um, that's also possible. That's something that you can do through two possible events for that purpose, which is the on custom compare and the on raw compare event. The one is triggered on custom compare passing the cell value as strings to that compare routine where you return whether it's larger than smaller than or equal the on raw compare just returns the cell indexes and you can retrieve the value that is behind these cells yourself whether that's a string or another type of data and also return um, the result of your own custom comparison uh, this way. Lots of properties are also allowing you to customize uh, all kinds of little details involved with um, sorting. And so, for example, an obvious uh, property index color, when you choose indexed sorting, you will have a little sort colored sort indicator and you can set the background core here with this uh, property. Normally standard, there is a triangle um, shown up or down indicating the sort direction, but there is also the up glyph and a down glyph property that allows you to customize um, these uh, settings. Maybe it's a good idea to first have a look at sorting before we go to filtering in the last demo here. So we have um, the grid with, and we are going to load the same data as the second example into that grid. And we are going to allow uh, sorting. And here I have um, this radio group from where I can select whether it will be normal sorting or index sorting. The code for that is simply manipulating the uh, properties show or index show, depending on what we want. And we are also going to do programmatic sorting where we will set the column for which we want to perform the sort and the direction and then perform the actual sorting. And the same applies for the index sorting, so using multiple columns for uh, doing our sort. And uh, for using multiple columns, we have our sort indexes property, which is a list of indexes of columns that need to be used for our sorting. So we can add indexes, so that will be the first column to sort on in ascending order, column five, and then the second criteria for the sort will be column one, also in ascending order. When these settings are set, we can add a third column and a fourth column, etc. When the settings are good, we call grid uh, sort indexed. 
and it will use these settings to perform the sort. So let's uh, launch this application and see this here working. So sorting is not enabled. We see just the data loaded in the grid. That's it. And when I now enable normal sort, I can start clicking on the row headers. And as you can see, it uses these columns uh, to perform um, the sort. When I use index sort, I can click column and you see now this uh, little uh, yellow triangle with the number one, because that is the first column uh, criteria to perform the sort on. And I can uh, add an additional column it toggles, of course, when I click the same column. But when I now uh, shift click on a second column, you see that it uses this column as the second criteria for the sort. And I can use yet a third criteria, etc. When I do a normal click again, it is back to um, the first column for my sorting. And when I do the same thing programmatically here, I have sorted in order of the horsepower. Um, and here I perform an index sorting programmatically with the first criteria, the cylinders, and the second uh, criteria, the brand of the car. And that brings us to the last topic that I wanted to cover for today, which is uh, the filtering capabilities in the grid. Basically, filtering is um, possible via the user interface so that the user can enter the filter conditions. And there are two main ways to do that via the filter drop down, which is a drop down list of the possible values to filter on, or via the filter edit, which is um, in place editors in the, the header of the grid and setting from there the filter criteria. Or um, it is also possible, of course, to perform programmatic sorting. And for doing programmatic sorting, there is um, the grid.filter, which is a collection of filter conditions. And so there you can add multiple filter conditions. Um, and then when all your conditions are set, you set grid.filter active to true. And this will perform the actual filtering in uh, the grid. There are some related events. Normally, when you enable filter dropdown or filter edit, one of these two, every column becomes uh, a column where you can perform filtering on via these events on has filter edit or on get column filter. You can control dynamically whether some column maybe has no filtering capabilities or you can control with the on get column filter what the filter values will be for some specific column. When there are no values, it will not be possible to um, filter. And so let's have a look at that part of this last uh, demo. Here you can see uh, the radio group from where I select my filter uh, method. And from here you see that um, depending on the checked uh, value, we enable uh, the filter drop down or we enable the filter edit. And we also uh, implemented some programmatic filtering. Let's have a look at that code behind. Here you can see that I set the active filter to false. So all filtering disabled. I clear my filter conditions collection. So all start from fresh all filter previous filter conditions are removed and then I add uh, here in this particular case two um, new filter conditions. The one will be a filter conditions condition for column five which happens to be the cylinder column and here I set as my condition I want this value to be larger or equal than eight that is the condition and I add a second uh, condition this time for the first column. And here I set that the brand uh, is a text value that starts with these five letters. And 
I specify also the filter operation, um, which here is a logical AND operation. So it will um, here um, imply that uh, both this filter condition and this filter condition are true um, for the row to be withheld uh, in the filtering. You can have other logical operations like OR. Uh, if you have a look, these are uh, several um, logical operations that are possible between filter conditions. So let's have a look at this demo. Okay, and now, first of all, I will enable the filter drop down. So notice these little drop down icons. And from here, there is already a drop down list from where I can select the value. And this drop down list is automatically filled with the unique values of that particular column. So here, I can add the second condition, like the eight cylinder condition or I can remove this filter again by selecting all. And so this is without writing any code, just setting that filter dropdown auto to true. That is the filtering that is already built in possible via the, the grid. If I select um, filter editing, you can see here that uh, it's changed to, uh, first of all, um, that I can select um, the, the filter function and then also edit the filter value. So let's, for example, here in our cylinder column, I will set it larger than, let's take five so that I withhold also the six cylinder uh, cars. And maybe um, here I, for this one, I can set, I want it to be smaller than uh, 2000, I believe. That's I would still have some values. So this is how, and then you can of course clear it via these uh, options, but this is how you can use the filter edit to perform filtering. And finally, uh, programmatic filtering. This is activating the filter that I had defined. Column five needed to be larger or equal than eight. And column one, uh, I wanted the preferred brand. Um, some of you might not be surprised of this selection here that I withhold with my filtering. And that uh, brings us to um, the end of this session of what was prepared. There are some bonus slides for which there is not sufficient time, but these bonus slides will be in the download that you uh, get but that brings us actually to the questions and answers. So um, in the download, I have uh, prepared, you have all the uh, demos, the five demos that I uh, prepared for this uh, webinar. And normally I should have activated now uh, this download so that you can uh, grab it. Um, it also contains the slides, so the bonus slides that deal with column uh, hiding and row hiding are also in there. And you can use um, these slides in your available time to discover what is um, also possible with column hiding and row hiding. And that is um, the end of this introduction to a number of what I think um, important features of our grid, uh, features that can um, allow you to, with a minimum amount of code, uh, already show uh, data in various ways to your users, allow them to edit the data in uh, various ways, um, etc. So now I want to take some time for your questions. So I'm going through uh, all the questions that I see uh, here. Um, First question, do you re recommend to use the wrapper or use the appropriate events to change the cell properties, for example, cell cores? Well, um, this is um, a matter of the choice here depends on, I think, uh, on one side, convenience. I think properties can be convenient, like grid.colors, column row, and set the 
color from there is a convenient way, programmatically easy way to control this. But you need to know that when you use these properties, of course, that involves memory allocation for holding these settings. And so you need to know that the more uh, of these settings you use for, for like millions of cells, that of course will eat memory. And I would recommend that if you uh, deal with really large amounts of data, and then I'm talking about 100,000 rows and more, um, then uh, I think it's really uh, suggested to use the event handlers. Um, because that will be way lighter in terms of uh, memory usage. Of course, it can also be practical to use event handlers to set that dynamically. For example, um, it is simply a, a, like three or two lines of code to um, set the cell core depending on cell value rather than looping through all cells and there apply the logic to determine the cell core and then use grid.colors to set that core. So um, yeah, that would be my recommendation for um, the choice between dynamically setting cell properties and setting them via properties. Um, okay, the session is uh, recorded, so will become available at a later time when we have finished it. Um, next question is, uh, beginner date, end update will stop all backgrounds events from the grid. Actually, begin update, end update will block any um, rendering in the grid. So normally when you set the grid.cells equals some new cell text, that invokes a re-render of that grid cell. So anything that visually changes something in the grid invokes a re-render of the grid. And so using begin update, end update will stop all re-renders until you call end update. And so when you have large amounts of data to update in the grid, you will want to use that within a begin update, end update block. Um, the next question, so to have a checkbox uh, as multi-selects, it means the grid has to be in edit mode but you can still restrict what users can edit. Yes, of course. So indeed, and uh, when you add a checkbox and the grid is not editable, that checkbox will be by default uh, be disabled. Um, if you only, for example, want um, that say the first column in the grid contains checkboxes to select rows, for example, and you do not want any of the other cells being editable. You just want this first column with the checkbox to be usable to select rows. Then I suggest to simply set editing to true for the grid and use the on can edit cell event. And for every other column than the first column that has the checkbox, um, set can edit to false. And so none of the other cells will be editable but your checkboxes will be usable. Um, is it possible to outline the cell rather than change the color when selecting the cell? That is uh, possible indeed. There is a property for that. And let me look up that property. Um, and it should be under Here it is the selection rectangle. You can see that it already shows a thicker line as a selection rectangle. And I can uh, set the selection core. If I set this on. Okay, so no selection background core, but still in selection um, border. Um, and I believe Selection rectangle. Good. Let me have a look. Properties. Oops. Insert key. Okay. Bot uh, selection. 
rectangle color, there is a property for that. So if you would want a red border for showing the selected uh, cell, that is uh, how you can do that. All right, let's go to the next question. As far as I know, Excel cannot make use of HTML colored words in cell text. That is correct. Uh, to my knowledge, it is indeed not possible. Uh, so as it is not possible or supported in Excel, uh, what we do is um, show the text as plain text in that case in uh, the Excel cell. Um, and then I see some question after export of the bit to XLS or XLSX. I think that is part of that previous uh, question related to HTML colored words in cell text with uh, in connection to exporting this to Excel. Um, session will be posted to YouTube. That was a question. Uh, can create items of column two function of value of cell. Um, that question is not entirely clear to me. Um, if this question relates to um, adding functions that will um, change cell data depending on data in other cells, then you're actually referring to a kind of spreadsheet functionality. There is actually an um, descending component, the ADV spread grid. This is class that descends from T ADV string grid, but it adds um, the handling functions like Excel does, like sum and other concatenation operations. All these functions are available. And so this might be something to look at for you if you look at, um, yeah, automatically deriving cell data from other cell content. Question, is it possible to download the demo code? You should have received it now via this uh, Web Academy interface. If not, uh, let us uh, know. Um, but also take in account that we um, have also put this download here via HTTP. If uh, you watch this at a later time, or if you prefer this method, this is also where our code of today and where the presentation of today can be found. Is it possible to make the content of the filter drop down dependent from another filter drop down? Um, that should be possible, um, as this on get column filter event is called to fetch the content of your drop down. It will pass in the parameter the list of values for the drop down. And uh, you can change in your code, in that event handler, you can change that string list of values. And you can add your own values, remove values, replace it with entirely different values. So that is a way to dynamically change um, the values in the filter drop down. Um, another question is, uh, apart from the VCL grid, is it correct that the web for this presentation show? Okay, I think this refers to the web string grid, which is a grid that is part of TMS web core. Um, so uh, web string grid, I would um, um, I would refer to this as a um, grid that is inspired in the first place by the standard VCL string grid and um, will be further expanded, of course, inspired by the VCL grid, the, the VCL ADV string grid. At this moment, we are far from there. Uh, this uh, VCL string grid is the result of uh, by now 26 years of work um, and obviously we have not spent that much uh, years in the web string grid. It won't take 26 years as we learn a lot of course during these uh, years. Um, but on the other side, if you look at the grid with um, 
almost all the features that I covered here today during this presentation, but for the web, I would suggest to have a look at our FNC grid, which is the grid that is in the FNC UI pack. That FNC grid was inspired by ADV string grid. It has an almost similar feature set. It was rewritten from scratch to be not only cross-platform, but also um, to be uh, usable from the web, from a browser. So the FNC grid, the filtering, the sorting, the editing, all these things are available and all these things are usable in uh, WebCore. So that's what I would recommend to have a look at. Then um, I see a reference to um, the webinars from uh, Wagner about X data, but I think this is not directly related to the webinar here today. Some features are found in the TMS FNC grid and some not, uh, not in the same page, page or place, sorry. Uh, will there be convergence in the future? No, there will be no convergence in the future. Uh, it is absolutely not the intention to have an interface compatible FNC grid. And this is for the very reason that the FNC grid is the result of uh, 26 years of experience and learning and history. In the ADV string grid, during these 26 years, we have always paid an extreme amount of attention to backwards compatible compatibility. So if users have an application built with ADV string grid like 10 years ago, and now they would migrate to Delphi 11 and um, the latest version of the grid, the code normally should still work as it was and work unchanged. Uh, but for the FNC grid, we had the opportunity to start from a clean sheet that means also um, have a property organization started from scratch. And that was an opportunity to make it somewhat cleaner, somewhat more organized uh, by not having to carry around um, the backwards compatibility and all the history. So that's uh, the direction that we are going uh, forward in the future. Okay. Okay, now that I have the FNC grid, is an easy way to copy from ADV string grid. So it's, it's heavily inspired. So um, most of the concepts, IDs, and, and actually also parts of the code will transfer nice, but absolutely not everything for the reason I explained that the interface was created from scratch with the clean sheets and also a kind of cleanup of history that uh, has been creeping in in the ADV string grid for so long. And uh, let's have a look at the other tab for um, more questions. Is it possible to animate a cell border instead of um, coloring the whole cell? Well, um, I'm not sure what kind of animation uh, you talk about, uh, but it is possible to only change the cell border color. Um, there is an event for that on get cell border, and that event can be used to specify a specific color or a specific also pen width for drawing a uh, cell border. And uh, so this is possible to use and, and instead of uh, changing the background color of the cell. Is there a way to load from JSON at this moment? Uh, unfortunately, there is not a load from JSON. And the reason why there is no load from JSON is that the JSON file does not necessarily contain uh, two-dimensional data. And so it is a kind of problematic to um, show non-two-dimensional data in a two-dimensional two -dimensional structure. And that's, that's the reason why it's not uh, here. Um, I see um, people wanting something about the DB ADV grid, which is actually a component descending from ADV string grid that adds the uh, data, data set interface so that you can immediately show data from data sets, uh, edit 
data in data sets. Um, so that's a good suggestion. And actually, um, we will take it in account and uh, consider it for a future um, webinar. Is it possible to combine filtering and sorting? Yes, that is possible after you have filtered the grid. Nothing prevents you from sorting within uh, the, the data that remains after filtering. So both can be used at the same time. Are the, futures, are the features of the FNC grid basically the same? Answer is um, a, to a very large degree, yes, um, it was inspired by the ADV string grid. Um, and so the filtering, the sorting, the editing capabilities, the grouping, um, all these um, auto size columns, etc. All these capabilities are also available in the FNC grid. And I think that brings us to the end of uh, the questions of today. And so I'm left with uh, thanking you for attending this first uh, webinar of uh, 2022. We um, want to bring many more webinars this year. We need your um, ideas, your needs, of course. Let us know what topics you want to see covered. DB ADV grid is already noted and will be taken in account for future webinars. Um, if you want to see webinars on other topics, you know where to find us, email us, leave a message on social media, wherever we will notice it and we will take it in account for future webinars. Thank you very much uh, for um, spending your time here, for bringing uh, the time with us and for um, learning what's possible in ADV String Grid. We, I think we scratched the surface here. We could go much, much deeper into detail. We didn't cover, cover uh, grouping, for example. We didn't cover all the capabilities for um, automatically advancing uh, and automatically inserting rows while editing, etc. That could be a topic, uh, a kind of advanced ADV string grid webinar. If you feel for that, if you think that is uh, something you have an interest in, you would like to see, you would like to see particular technical topics covered, send us an email and we look forward to bring that to you. Thanks again for your time and uh, all and I'm wishing you all a good remainder of the day. Enjoy Delphi, enjoy programming, and enjoy all uh, the components. Thank you very much until the next time.